Hello and welcome to KTN Africa Speaks. I'm Joy Doreen Bira. Today is the 5th of April and our major focus is going to be on life in the diaspora where we ask why is it difficult for some African migrants to return home even while living under unpleasant conditions? The hashtag this afternoon is life in the diaspora. But first let's take a look at Web City. Lupita Nyong'o. Oscar-winning actress Lupita Nyong'o is the face of French cosmetics giant Lancôme. Lupita becomes the first black ambassador for the brand joining Julia Roberts' Penelope Cruz as promoter of the brand whose advertisements are meant to start in a few weeks. The Kenyan star who shot to fame in the film 12 Years a Slave is Lancôme's first black ambassador. The 31-year-old is the fourth Academy Award-winning Lancôme ambassador. Hi, I'm Lupita Nyong'o and I'm incredibly excited to let you know that I am the new ambassadress for Lancôme. See you soon. So we asked a mind-boggling question to take a pick of the minds of Africans in case there was an African presidential swap. Under the hashtag African Presidential Swap, who they wish to be swapped to and for their country. Kenya's CJ Miller thinks Paul Kagame would do for Kenya and Uhuru Kenyatta for Rwanda. Monama Sakar from Uganda suggests King Moswati for Somalia. And Lodel Twino from Rwanda says Ian Kama of Botswana would do well for Uganda and Museveni of Uganda to Botswana. Fathans of Kenya suggests Liberian President Serlef for Kenya and the nerd believes Kagame would do well in Ghana. And while the hashtag is still attracting some more interesting views and tweets. And well, that hashtag was started by Katie and Africa Speaks. Apparently it's trending in Zimbabwe, in Ghana as well as Uganda. Now, let's take a look at Click. Africans, no matter the country we hail, we got one thing in common. We know how to make the most out of life, and children are the best way to explain this. Take a look at this video that has since gone viral since it was uploaded on YouTube. Click picked this video that has gone viral on YouTube of African kids making the most out of a dance from a song by a Ugandan artist, Eddie Kenzo.
Interesting. And it's just funny how we tend to make the most out of life. It doesn't matter whether you're wearing the right clothes, clean or not clean. You know, one thing we know how to do is make happiness out of our situations. And now on to the platform. There are about 8.8 .8 million African migrants living in Europe, in North America and in Australia. Small but increasing numbers of Africans are also starting to cave out, of, uh, cave out a life for themselves in Asia and the Middle East, taking advantage of changing economic centers of gravity. Meanwhile, more than half of all African migrants, that's about 13.2 million people, live on the continent itself, according to the Global Mi uh, Migrant Origin Database. And according uh, around maybe 1.5 million Zimbabweans have migrated to South Africa in search of work. But after the xenophobic attacks on foreigners in 2011, many returned home. Now, South Africa's police services say they currently deport around 300 undocumented migrants back to Zimbabwe every day. Immigrants uh, who continue to traverse the world as well uh, do so in search of better economic uh, standards of living. And of course, some of them are in search of just better living conditions. Some of them running away from uh, the insecurity back home. Now in studio, we got Violet Barasa, who has lived in the diaspora, to be particular, in the UK for the past seven years and is now back home. And also via Skype, we have Obang Metho, who, uh, who is an Ethiopian uh, citizen currently living and working in Canada. Thank you both for joining us. And today uh, we're asking the question, why is it difficult for some African migrants to return home even while they're living under unpleasant conditions? The hashtag uh, today is life in the diaspora. So share your views with us, your experiences as well uh, as having lived in the diaspora. If you're back home or if you are currently living there, what is your experience? What are some of the challenges uh, we're going to be speaking as well to some of the people living abroad to share their views on the same. Violet, thank you so much for joining us in thank studio. You. My pleasure. How would you sum up your stay in the United Kingdom for the past seven years? Very mixed. Um, very good experiences mm -hmm. um, and not very good experiences. Uh, I, I could say it was a very mixed, yeah. very 50-50 um, experience, personal experience. Um, very good because I went there as a student. The, the best that you can be as an African abroad is when you're a student. Mm -hmm. Because within the student community, you get to meet other migrants or other students from different uh, corners of the world. So you feel into this bubble of everybody's foreign and you feel at home. Mm -hmm. um, the other 50 bit that was not exactly pleasant was when you finish your university, when you finish your education, get into the world of work where you live and pay bills and you are as normal as anyone else on the streets. That's when you start confronting some of the challenges that right. other Africans will agree with. Interesting. So at the end of it all, when you're done with school, some some of the people who go out there want to stay and work a bit because they probably want to support their families back home but then of course life doesn't treat them as best as they would have hoped there's a lot that's going on there there's stigma there's a lot of racism and all that what has been your experience in in that line uh, incidentally you've mentioned touched on key issues that i well, w would you know, put in a paradigm of an African experience abroad. Uh, the confrontation with issues of racism, the hardships, the discrimination uh, on everyday levels, mm. some of which is mild, um, but discrimination ne all the same. So, for example, uh, when, when I finished studying, I tried to find work immediately uh, because my grant, study grant had uh, finished and I, I needed to pay for housing, for what and other bills, transport and, and all that. So the most natural thing to do was find work. Um, and I did find work. Uh, it wasn't uh, in the field that I'd studied. It wasn't a very uh, a good job as it were, but it was work all the same mm -hmm. compared to other things that Africans do, uh, you know, working in care homes or 
uh, working in, in supermarket stores at, as tailors. Mm -hmm. It was a job. I worked with uh, a small NGO that uh, deals with people living with disabilities. Um, and in, there, in, in, those, in that context, that's when I came face to face with the harsh realities of being a foreigner um, abroad. Obviously, people uh, were looking at me very differently, saying, asking things uh, that you would think people would know. For example, saying, hey, do you speak African? Um, and I say, what do you mean I speak African? Mm -hmm. And I, I speak Swahili from, from Kenya. And they say, yes. oh, what's Kenya? What's Swahili? <laughs> and I say, what do you do? And somebody says, well, I'm, I'm a teacher, or I work in a bank, or I'm an attorney. And I would think, well, and you don't know where Kenya is, and we mm -hmm. spend eternity trying to understand how your world works and ask a class three kid at mm -hmm. home, mm -hmm. and they will know who is the queen of England by name. And you That's have no true. interest at, you know, in our lives. Well, um, in, in this case, I know sometimes, you know, there are instances where you are out there and somebody is saying, oh, you're from Africa. Um, how is Angola? I'm like, yeah, actually, I'm <laughs> from Kenya. And then, you know, when you tell them, I work in Kenya, you know, the next question is going to be, do you know Reverend Miguel, <laughs> who, you know, he preached in, in Angola, maybe say in 1999. And you're thinking, okay, so these guys actually think <laughs> Africa is like a small village, That's right. uh, where Angola is maybe the next neighboring parish That's or right. municipality yeah. somewhere, somehow. But anyway, we are talking about life in the diaspora. And now we'd like to connect to Obang Metho, who is joining us live via Skype uh, from Canada. Metho, thank you for joining us. Um, what is your experience so far living in the diaspora and how long have you lived in Canada? Well, thank you, Joy. I've been in Canada for a long time. I would say that I've lived uh, half of my life in abroad. I came when I was 16. And so that was almost now 24 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I even went to high school from grade 10 to at 12, I went to high school in Canada, and then also that I went to college, university in Canada as well. So, uh, you know, hearing from the sister, the experience is, yeah, definite that uh, it's different because one thing sometimes, you know, people who leave the country and can live abroad, sometimes, you know, you are here in your mind is back at home, uh, you know, and sometimes also, as he said, 50 50, you know, in anywhere, even back at home, there are those kind of things where you face <clears throat> the different things that which you face. So, but for me, I really, uh, you know, I had went to school here, especially where I used to live in Canada, where there's not many African at all. I remember that high school, I could go for almost two months without seeing someone who looked like me. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but yeah, you know, finishing school, one thing that I really wanted to know was really to go back and contribute back at home. I think sometimes most of the people in the diaspora where I don't think people have a choice. And sometimes some people have choice, the majority of the people, I think, don't have a choice back at home. Uh, if some people have a choice, I think some group will choose to go back and stay back in their own countries. Uh, so as I think Sister said, that there's many people, and you mentioned it, many people who are working a terrible job, you know, and then they're supporting their family back home. And so really, uh, I don't think most of the diaspora is African. Honestly speaking, I've been given a choice either to stay here or to go back at home. Uh, especially the one who came as a refugee, who are, they don't have school, the kind of job they do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, actually, if you look at it in 2000, according to the data, in 2013, in Africa who live outside Africa, they sent $60 billion back to Africa to support their family. That's a tremendously, the money that the head money gave to Africa is only 26, 27 billion. And the money that, you know, with this gold economy is booming in Africa is almost about, you know, 30 billion. But the money that, you know, the diaspora sent back to Africa is $60 billion. So that, I think, is one of the things that keeping people to support their family back at home. As I say, some people don't have a choice. Right. Uh, well, $60 billion, as you put it. But let's focus on the uh, those African migrants who are living abroad, 
but are not really living pleasant lives. Some of them probably sleeping on the streets. Uh, some of them don't even have the best of living conditions. They may be sharing a, a house with about maybe 15 other housemates. And then at the end of the day, they do not really have proper jobs. So their employment is not really uh, one that you would support if you are going to say they're living abroad, but then not really living under pleasant conditions. So why is it difficult? What are some of those reasons that some of these African migrants do not want to return home, even when they know that at home they have a bed to sleep on, they have a shelter over their heads. You know, why is it so difficult? I think some of them is a shame. I think guilt and shame, as you put it, that, that some Africans who have these high expectations, thinking that by coming to abroad, you know, things will be easy for them. But when they come here, the life is so difficult. And so those who don't have the skill and don't have to work in this, yeah, there's many of them that who end up becoming, you know, an homeless. And the sad part of it also is that so there are Africans who come from Africa directly with airplane to come here. And there are other Africans who are dying trying to go to the West and to go to a place through, you know, Red Sea, through Somalia and through this. So some of them, I think, is really, uh, as I say, they have this high expectation, thinking that they can come to a port, get mm -hmm. a get home and all of these things and so when they don't meet that expectation they have a psychological problem so you have a different sector of uh, stakeholders and then you have african who are really uh, trying to once they get here and they have their life they don't want anything to do with the continent anymore so you have a you know a class a different group of people the one who really made it very well they want to mingle hand and say that, you know, I'm out from African problem. I don't want to hear about Africa. They want to live an American, British, Canadian dream. Right. And then you have others who are working very hard trying to help their family back home. And the other one who cannot make it at all, like the one you're saying, that they become homeless, they live in money place, and they don't have a job. So really, they, when we talk about the diaspora, it ranges from the societies. Those who made it very well, they, you know, some of them really want to live. Those who are really working, helping their families there, and those who cannot make it, still trying to mingle in where there's not even, their existence is not noticed by the authority or wherever they live there. Right. Uh, let, let's get back to Violet. Violet, um, what exactly drove you to coming back home before we can get views from uh, the United States and uh, some of the Africans living in the United States? What drove you to coming back home? Well, I think it's just, uh, for me, it was as uh, the gentleman in Canada has, has said, mm -hmm. it was the choice that I had. Um, it was for me the, the realization that there was a country that I came from um, and that I had met perhaps some strides and I wanted to come back and make a contribution to use the education that I'd had to make a contribution to the development of this nation. Mm -hmm. And I knew that was a tough choice. I knew that I, I'm coming back to home, to, to a country where I'm not guaranteed work. Um, I'm coming back to a country where perhaps expectations were higher, right. that uh, I would come with a lot of money or I would come with uh, uh, probably resources to establish myself. Mm -hmm. um, but be beyond that, I had this desire to say, well, I'm better off on stood up on my feet in my country than perhaps living on my knees abroad. So you weren't afraid of your parents, you know, saying, uh, so where is all this money? You know, seven <laughs> years down the line, you know, they expect you to probably be having quite a number of pounds, uh, knowing you're coming from the UK, uh, they expect you to have a substantial amount of, of money on you, and mm -hmm. so you're coming back to better their lives. Uh, what, what was the reaction from, from your parents when you said, I'm coming back home? Thank you. 
Can the diaspora contribute back at home? There's much that, as we have a weakness of the institution back at home, we also have a weakness because we are disconnected. And also, the another thing that's this African analogy, where you know you cross the road to go bring something to the family, you know, bring, come back. So, for instance, all of we go to the farm and then we bring food home. We go to you know to hunting. We bring the meat home. People who come to abroad. Some of them, they want to go back home to take it back, you know. So some of those, as you put it, if they don't have anything to that or they didn't earn any money, it's a shame for them to go back. But there are other, where it's safe and peace country, that the where they can go in. So I think security is one thing that which is make it to those who are really uh, educated, have the opportunity, want mm -hmm. to go back, they cannot. And also depend. If you look at it, you don't see the influx of immigrant from Tanzania or from Kenya or from other places like in Ethiopia where in two months 180,000 will be taken back from Saudi Arabia to Ethiopia. So it depends from country to country. There's those countries who are, you know, really respect, have a respect for their own citizens, their citizens go back home. So this is, I think, that, you know, depend. We cannot say the whole Africa. There's some African who are better off and there are other Africans who are worse off because of that. The regimes is also that because of, for instance, when you look at it in my own country, they say economy has grown by double digit better than Kenya. If it is better than Kenya, why the Ethiopian are running out everywhere? Mm -hmm. So in Kenya, you know, you don't see, you don't hear that the Kenyan are drowning in the Red Sea. You don't hear that Kenyan are, you know, uh, dying in the Malta and all of this. Why? Because I think that the government, you don't also hear the Tanzanian, you don't also hear the Cameroonian. So it's depend also that. So you see a group of like Ethiopian. It is a way of running away from, you know, all of this, you know, there's no economy, there's no job, things are good, for, difficult for them. And again, also sister said earlier about what we face in Africa sometimes. Right. We have um, now that reminds me, there was the economic crisis as well, which did affect some of the African migrants living abroad. And uh, that is in Europe as well as in America. Now, how do we actually believe that the life that they're living there, despite the economic crisis that actually uh, had an impact on their lives as well as their work, is, is not really what they're going through up until today because what we see right now is a situation of some of them who haven't recovered uh, from the economic crisis from the recession up until today they are still you know having to live lives that are less of what they would have expected uh, before the economic crisis yes i think that right now you know when there was economic crisis in america it affected so many uh, immigrants you know sometimes when you look at the african they're very hard working they work in a meat factory, they work in construction, they work. And so when those jobs lost, they were really lost. They also that, you know, many of them faced that. And also that foreclosing in America. Most of them they have worked very hard and they have three jobs and they try to, you know, to have opportunity to 
get a house. And so when the, you know, the housing mortgage collapsed, so many uh, Africans were kicked out, you know, foreclosing. So since then, they, they really, they never recover. You are right. So these Africans never recover. And sometimes some of them, that the little saving they have because they lost their job, they have to really take that. And also, keep in mind that one African who are here, they may be supporting 10, 5 family back at home. Mm -hmm. So this economy, when it's really affecting the American, it's affecting African more than the American, especially those who are working a labor job, who are working minimum wage, who are working like almost three day job, four job, even five jobs. You know to to maintain this so it really do affect them a lot but again as i was saying that some of them would have a choice to go back but again because of the security political security they cannot go but there are some of them who say that i cannot make it i will go back at home so right. it is really because there are people who really try their very best but the system also that being you know not from this country and even when economy collapse so they kind of put the interest to the people who are here more of them even though they are paying tax like everybody else the system also that they become a disadvantage. Again, there's no institution that really there to promote for them to you know to you know to make them you know come up again. You know, so but again they never give up. And there's some one thing that something that I really do admire about our people. You know, many of them they come here and you know they those who try to work as much as they can to help. And that is something that which is I sometimes I think African who work abroad yes. in this little job in this dirty job. If the African work like that, if they have that opportunity back at home, I'm sure that Africa not only has running away, even the Western would be coming back there. Right. Well, uh, thank you very much for those views right there. Now, Violet, um, from your own point of view, I'm sure since you returned home, you've had all these ideas running through your mind, and you actually have seen what is in the UK that can be as well implemented back home. And you're thinking probably these are some of the ideas that... Uh, African migrants living out there need to come back home and you know take advantage of That's which right. are some of those areas that you have as, as, as an African you know explored out there and said you know if I could tell my friends to come back home these are some of the gaps that we think can be filled well I think uh, there is there has been so much to learn in, in, in this period of time that I've uh, stayed abroad and one of the major things that I burn with passion and think, can I just sit down mm -hmm. with um, government ministries and say this to them, is how streamlined the transport system is. Mm -hmm. um, to get uh, transport companies, private transport companies, to get them um, streamlined to a level where um, obviously we have timetables that would run on, or, or cars on that public transportation would run on strict timetables. Mm -hmm. It will, it will first ease traffic on our roads. It will secondly make, you know, make sure that people get to and out of work uh, at set times. And it will massively contribute to, to the economy of the country because the amount of time that we, we waste waiting for public bus, you never know when it will show up or at the bus stop is ridiculous mm -hmm. and in, in a day I think that's about two hours per person that would have of, of, of roughly 16 million people that would have been used in an office working or on the streets doing, doing some work, right. doing development work. So right. I think that's one area. The other area uh, that I think the, the government is very thankfully doing or has started doing already is the welfare, the welfare system to help uh, the poorest of, mm -hmm. of, of our population and perhaps the marginalized groups, the disabled um, or the elderly, which is something that I, I picked up and thought, wow, this is really good because uh, there is a state pension for everybody over the age of 65 in mm -hmm. the UK, for example. Mm -hmm. And that means that people have a tiny safety net to go back to when they have if nothing else, uh, when, when they've retired out of paid employment or if they never worked at all and people with disabilities who can't go out there and work mm -hmm. have um, a provision to afford a living. Our housing for the poorest is terrible. It's, it's, it's something that um, our government and all of us really need to look at um, and perhaps make conditions easier for all, all of us so that everybody at least lives on a minimum, at a very minimum basic human condition. Right. So of course the introduction of a minimum wage um, 
for, for, for workers would go a long way mm -hmm. in securing that. But those right. are policy matters, I suppose. Well, there's a lot of issues that we can uh, go on talking about uh, life in the diaspora. And um, we would like to split this discussion into two. And next week, we want to discuss about life in the diaspora. And for people who still want to go out there, what is it that they should expect? because most of them are not prepared psychologically on what exactly they should expect when they go out there. So that is going to be our major discussion next weekend. And we're going to have another set of uh, people living in the diaspora who are going to be sharing their views on what you need to expect if you are back home or back in Africa, whatever nation it is, and would like to go out there, what should you expect the first uh, few months that you get there? And also how you need to go about certain issues to make your life comfortable abroad. Um, uh, looking at some of the views, let me just wind up with some of the views here. At Boaz, Van Chris is saying, actually, I would like to go study abroad and look for African jobs from there because it's much easier when you look for employment out there. And we're having uh, Alan Cheng, who is saying, a uh, good perspective on Kenyan and African lives, life in the diaspora. And we have Simon Robson, who is saying, the American dream turns out to be a nightmare for many professionals hoping for paradise. Uh, someone sent me an email just during the week and said that they completed uh, you know university with a second upper degree and then when they went to Austria you know first she had to learn how to speak the language mm -hmm. and then of course to get a job you need to have papers uh, of that country so she was taken back to the equivalent of high school and now she's just getting into university so that's how tough life can be yet it would have been simpler for her that's to right. just get a job back home instead of having to go through all of that so yes we're going to have another discussion about life in the diaspora what to expect when you're getting there and this conversation continues online under the hashtag life in the diaspora my name is Joy Doreen Bira. My guests have been Violet Barasa, a Kenyan who has been living in the UK for the last seven years, and is back home to explore some of those opportunities. And also Obang Metho, uh, who is currently living and working in Canada, but is an Ethiopian citizen. Thank you both for joining us on KTN Africa Speaks. And well, until next Saturday, God bless you all and take care.